what was the sensor can do? This is actually what they call a cyber tire sensor. It has an accelerometer which can measure the forces in three axes. Okay? It has a temperature, pressure, wear, and revolution sensor. How fast is the vehicle? How far is the tire rotating? It has, it has even a wear sensor that is it can actually sense whether the thread is wearing. There is a pressure sensor, of course, temperature sensor. And then it has a wireless communicator to the onboard computer, to the on to the dashboard, to the onboard computer. So there's a wireless communicator. So now this is this is packaging many uh, sensors inside it. Then also it has a strain sensor. Now once you have this kind of a device sitting inside the tire, what can you do with it? So suppose you can give decision support. You can do inference. Okay, the first thing is inference. The data can be used to make inferences. You can infer road condition. Is the road icy? Is the road wet? Is the grip good? By means of the strain gauges, by means of the, of the accelerometer, you can make an inference as to whether the road conditions are good. Can you determine the grip of, of the tire onto the road and, and water or skidding? You can sense whether the tire will be rotating so fast if I get a skidding. So you, can tell, you can tell the driver, look, your car is skidding. You can tell the driver, look, the road is icy slow down. That's the inference part. So you can do more. Now, once you, you make the sensor and the control computer a part of the drive train control group, you also have the software adjust the speed. Automatically, the software can slow the car down. Automatically, the car can start braking and even prevent skidding. Okay, so, you see, that now you have uh, a sensor, you have the inference, and you also have some control. Okay. And what's more, it doesn't require any battery change. The, uh, the movement of the, the vehicle itself by means of certain devices, think that it will volume can charge up internal battery. This is called energy harvesting. Okay, so I need to allow your battery change. You basically install the sensor on your tire, by the time the tire requires a change, the sensor is still still functioning. So that is the, 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 the dream of using this. But what is the challenge? Huge possibilities. Okay, this particular device, compared to all the four tires, huge possibilities. What's a big challenge? Do you want to trust your life to this? Do you want to trust the the decision that's been making for you. You want to let the control computer take charge of the vehicle? That's the big question. So you want robust decision support and control, and that is the challenge of CPS for the future. Okay. So where is CPS heading now? This is now a, a large, a large version of CPS. I'm not going to enlarge CPS from just being confined to a motor vehicle to basically running our lives for us. This is a physical domain. A physical domain which I'll tell you more about what physical domains they can be. The physical domain that you have seen until now is only a vehicle. It's a, it's a vehicle in which somebody is driving. The physical domain, probably it's too early for you to read from there. The physical domain that will have embedded in the physical domain some sensors. Like you saw, there was this Benelli cyber sensor in the wall of a vehicle. It will have embedded in the domain some actuators. Okay, for example, the brake is an actuator in a, in a car. You will have, uh, once you have a wireless, everything is wireless here. Remember, there can be two wires connecting the control computer to that the, the, the sensor. How will the wire rotate? So it has to be wireless. So, so one of the key things, one of the key differentiators of CPS of yesterday to CPS of tomorrow and today is wireless, wireless communication. Okay, so to communicate between the sensors, the actuators, back to the intelligence, to the cloud, so to say, you will have to have a wireless network. You have to have relays because maybe this is very far away from the, the internet. You have, you have to have gateway routers, and then you have the internet cloud, and you have analytics. So this is the broad architecture. You could confine this to a motor vehicle, or you can expand this to a city, expand this to an entire farm. Okay? So, you, so think of it in a very abstract manner as being a physical domain comprising sensors and actuators, a wireless communication network, an internet kind of a cloud, Intelligence of the battery. It could even be in practice the sensor actuator of the mobile, as you saw in the case of the vehicle, so the cyber tire sensor actually is mobile. And uh, typically, because of the distance between, in practice, distance between the, the devices and the internet, these hundreds of meters, maybe one kilometer, maybe five kilometers, you require what is called multi hop communication. That is, for a, for a signal to go from point A to point B, have to pass through point C and point D on the way. 
Now, uh, what is the vision for using this technology in the future? Smart and green buildings. Okay, uh, a very large amount of energy spent in buildings, lighting, in air conditioning. So, when we make the uh, another important problem is that in some areas of the world that the, that the, that the earthquakes. Can you put sensors into the building to be able to sense the building is safe to occupy after an earthquake? Network healthcare. Okay. Uh, people want more independence even though they have become old. Okay. They will be 70, 80, 90. They want to still move around. They can carry out their body sensors, whether it's for uh, sensing their uh, oxygen levels, whether sensing their cardiac condition, sensing their lung condition, and also carrying along with them sensors which, which sense the environment. Uh, for example, I have an area uh, di di disease. I may want to be concerned about the environment around me. So I can carry a sensor with you. I can have information from the surroundings telling me this room is not safe for you to enter or go there. Okay. So, mobile patient management, pediatric care, and variable health. <coughs> smart cities. We are getting more smart cities practically every day. Today, that has been given the sense of a smart city. Hopefully, in some years, we will have some aspect of a smart city. So transportation, pollution, and water distribution. Now, uh, they may appear like three or four different aspects, but uh, you can imagine that these are interlinked. Uh, clearly, the pollution in a city is governed by the, to some extent, governed by the transportation movement in the city. So if you are making a CBS for the entire city, a smart city, you may want to manage the pollution and transportation together. Agriculture. Now, uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, area. Uh, you must have seen that we dump huge amounts of uh, pesticides onto our farms. Essentially, you drive a plane over and you just dump any amount of pesticide on the farm that pollutes the ground, pollutes, it, it hurts the animals around, and a lot of it goes into our stomachs. Okay? Now, people have been working on, very hard working on sensors. Sensors that, if they are placed near a plant, can tell when the plant is getting infested at a very early stage, before even that infestation becomes serious enough, the pheromones from that organism can be detected. And then you go and apply the uh, insecticide right there, one part of the farm, rather than just dump uh, insecticide all over the place. So you can imagine farms which are instrumented with lots and lots of sensors, in virus communication, sensors can sense the level of infestation very early, Learn the farmer, the farmer goes and takes some action. Forest and wildlife, uh, they're very important for ecology. Forest fires, as you know, are, are common. Uh, human animal conflict is common. You can use this technology of CPS to uh, manage some of these things. Okay. I'll now go over some examples in a bit more detail. This is some work that we are doing at ISC. A very common problem in, in hospitals is that. Uh, uh, a mother gives birth to a, a premature baby and uh, cannot afford the hospital stay and needs to take the baby back, back to the village. Uh, can we give that mother a little device to put, put on the baby's maybe chest or stomach or something to keep monitoring that baby and alert the care, caregiver if there is a problem? This is the other end of life when people are very old. As I said, the older people are old, but they want to stay alone. They want to not be a burden on their children. So you can imagine that uh, the, the children are concerned about their parents' uh, well-being. What you can do is, you can instrument the entire apartment or the house with little devices, which that person will touch every day. They'll touch the fridge, they'll touch the car keys, they'll touch the, the TV remote. And when they do that, a certain pattern generates over the day. And if that pattern changes, it could be an indication of Alzheimer's, which is getting stronger. The indication of person has fallen and not not moving for a long time. So you can have a back-end uh, analytics, you know, giving you uh, information about the well-being of a uh, older person. <coughs> now, uh, let me read this. I don't know if you can read this. Uh, it's hard for you to read from here as well. This is a typical credit card statement that we may get. I'll read out the numbers. Let's try to build two and a half thousand rupees. Movie tickets, thousand five hundred rupees. Petrol, two thousand rupees. I didn't get 5,000 rupees, and so on and so forth. So every month I get my credit card bill, and I know that I spent so much money in every one of those those uh, expenditures. Okay, the next month I am short of money, and I want to control my expenditure. I know 
I will probably go to the restaurant less and I will probably not get expensive gifts. This is a monthly electricity bill, 15,000 rupees. Okay, what do I do with that? Okay. I want to control electricity consumption, I want to cut down on some things, I want to cut down you know, some things essentials. How do I manage the electricity bill in a way that you know, each and every device in my home, I have some insight in. So that is the, the era of smart building management in buildings. You want to be able to instrument your appliances, very simple. You want to instrument your appliances, your washing machine, your, uh, your electric car, and your charger, your pump, and so on and so forth, with these uh, little meters, which should eventually be able to come with the machine in the future. Okay? So, uh, and then there will be algorithms in the back end which can actually assist you and tell you that okay and then there is going to be an error when the, uh, the best form is going to give you pricing every hour they will say it's not like one price for the entire month, pricing every hour so now can we somehow combine the, the deep analytics we have, the deep understanding we have of appliance usage, pricing and optimized business energy UK, the prediction that there are 53 million smart meters that are 20 and this will imply apparently almost 30% in any savings. But one thing you are observing from what I've been telling you is that this technology is going to touch practically every aspect of technology. It's going to touch electronics. We require cheap electronics, low power electronics, electronics which is cheap but sensitive. Uh, you can imagine if I'm going to put a little device into every washing machine, it cannot be more than 500 rupees, maybe 3 or 400 rupees to be able to be marketable. And then uh, we need a lot of uh, expertise management analytics. You get so much data from all this stuff. How do you make sense of that data? Because analytics, machine learning, which all many of the young people here are, are learning about analytics, which machine learning is going to be very important in Kenya. Another area is wireless communication. And the wireless communication uh, is a big thing that's going to be, uh, you know, 5G and so on and so forth, and all sorts of different uh, variations, Wi Fi. It's going to be very important to be able to interconnect these devices with the uh, infrastructure. So, uh, this term here refers to, uh, you know, like farms, uh, agriculture, water networks, I'll tell you more about this in a minute. Building power management, uh, you, you may want to have a, a whole, your best form any responsibility of managing the apartments uh, which they are serving. And then distributed cities, I mean, this is all sort of very similar. So the thing is that uh, you want to do inference about and management of large social technical systems. And often, uh, this is often viewed as the, so now we are emerging from just controlling a vehicle. We are emerging into a world of CPS, where we are managing entire cities, large buildings, farms, and so, uh, one obvious application is parking, you know. Uh, it's, often, it's often said that 30% of downtown traffic is about advanced countries, it's just people look for parking. Okay, so, can we help uh, people who are driving around uh, busy areas to find parking quickly? You can imagine that all the airports can have in their sensors or cameras all attached to a back end which uh, can identify any parking spaces and then you have uh, an application. Here are some facts from, from, from Bangalore. In Bangalore, there are 10 million individuals, 10 million consumers, as of the data was taken. There are about 1 million endpoints for water distribution. And about 150 million liter, uh, 150 liters per person per day. 1,500 million liters are required per day. So that is the amount of water that the BWS distributes per day. There are 250 kilometers of big flow pipes. What are called GLRs, reservoirs on the ground. So, and these, this, this network of pipes from, from the Kaveri public stations to these GLRs incur a 3% loss. 3% of this is a, a lot of loss system. But then there is the pumping from the GLRs to overhead tanks which supply us, supply our house. 5,000 to make other pipes from the GLRs to overhead tanks, which can incur a 40% loss. 40% of the water, that means that if we get 1,500 milliliters per day, it's after 40% has been lost. So you can imagine uh, how much was pumped to get that much water. And then, 
It turns out that we have one million people of storage capacity in tanks in our own, uh, in our own tanks, in our houses and apartments. So 8,000 million liters of storage in households, sorry, this is the, the storage capacity in the million dollars in tanks, 8,000 million liters were in households. So, so if all those tanks are full, we have three days worth of water stored in people's personal tanks. That is the extent of the problem that we have this SMP space today. So can we use smart water management to manage this entire system? Okay. So uh, it appears to be very simple. The other day I found that in my neighborhood, they were going around drilling more than these three meters to test for water leakage. But they can do it once, but how do you do it at a constant level? Can we have a mechanism by which we actually embed sensors into our water system and then have them there? analytics in place to be able to sense the water leakage. The other day, uh, many years back, I saw they were laying a sewage pipe. The sewage pipe was being laid above the water pipe. You can imagine the implication of that. Okay. So, uh, leakage of sewage into, into waterways, into our, uh, into our uh, drinking water is an important problem. So, 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 so leak, leak detection, tracing the leaks, water quality management, are all issues facing uh, uh, the city water situation system. So there is now uh, 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 a conceptualization of that uh, smart water network. You have sensors and actuators. You have hydraulic models of water flow. So if somewhere you see that there is a uh, uh, somewhere you see that there is uh, uh, water loss, you, you sense water loss because of your four meters. You want to be able to trace back and so we take, uh, infer, we have the inference problem to infer where the water may have been leaking. You, you can't place sensors everywhere, you place sensors judiciously and be able to infer from that where the water may be leaking. Or you sense the water quality has become bad in some part of the network, you want to be able to trace back more and be able to infer where the, the pollution may have, the impurity may have entered. Okay? So leak prediction, uh, SCADA, integration, and Okay, so I am now giving you a sense of this emerging area of CPS. We will require a lot of devices, we will require a lot of sensors all over the place in a very smart city infrastructure, personal communication devices in all your body, household appliances and cars, personal care devices and equipment, factories, farms and water products. There is even a thought uh, that every single box of medicine will carry in it a sensor which will keep telling us not only whether the medicine is still good but what route it may have passed through. Every single box of milk will carry in it a sensor which will not only tell us whether the milk is good now but what route it may have passed through. Also, every package will be about ultimately by some to and Amazon will have in it a sensor to track it. Okay, so you, you will see that there the, is the a proliferation and expected of these small electronic devices. These are some diagrams drawn by people from Cisco and another group. Uh, this sort of says that around 2020, there will be about 50 billion devices. So roughly about in the population is 6 billion, about 8 or 9 devices per person. And the, the vision is that you may have hundreds of thousands of devices per person in the long run. Already, if you look at a cell phone, in a cell phone you have 6 sensors or 7 sensors. So already, cell is already there. This is another interesting diagram. When I was growing up, we had about a million people per computer. Then when I was in IT Kanpur, we had about a thousand people per computer. The population of IT Kanpur supported by one computer. Then around when I was building the work and I had the first job and so on and so forth, we had the era of the PC, one person per computer. And now we are aiming at a situation where we have thousand computers per person. So it's one of these terms that are around. So now let's come to IoT finally. Okay, so what is this vision of IoT? To understand that, I'm going to throw in some numbers. The numbers are, are sort of slightly approximate, but give you a sense of, of, uh, of numbers. Let us start with the middle link here. This is what we call the fringe internet. The fringe internet. I'm sure many of you here have Wi-Fi at home. Okay, so that Wi-Fi device in your home is counted here. It's a part of the fringe internet. It is, the, it is a device which gives me service to the internet. Okay. 
Now, given that there are about 6 billion people in the world, you can expect there are about 1 billion of devices, say 1 per family. So let, let's say there are 1 million free internet nodes in the world. Now, let's go inside, let's go to the internet itself. In the internet, there are about 1 million nodes. These are the big routers in air conditioned rooms. They will take a lot of heat. They look like refrigerators. And they belong to Reliance and AT&T and Tata uh, Telecom and so on. So they are the routers run by the telecom companies. There are about 1,000 here. So 1,000 times nodes uh, are there to the internet. The vision is that the Internet of Things will have even a thousand times of the, the fringe internet. So there are a billion nodes here, there will be a trillion nodes in the Internet of Things. Okay, about a thousand devices, small, small, small devices per roughly per family. Or okay. smart building, smart metering, industrial automation, logistics, personal care, transportation, phones, almost everything eventually will have. Now let's look at some, some numbers of technology. I'm sure now all of us have used the internet for many years. These acronyms make sense. MBPS, we pay for MBPS every month, so, so we know what MBPS is. A typical link in the internet is carrying bits at 100 Gbps, 100 gigabit per second. Optical links, it's all optical links. Very high quality links between two. A typical link in your Wi-Fi network, or in your home internet, or your office internet, 100 Mbps, back from 1,000, 1,000 of the speed. So 1,000 as many nodes, 1,000 of the speed. You can make a link in the IoT network with 100 Kbps, 100 kilobits per second. So 1,000 of 100 Mbps. So very low speed, very low speed links will be there in the, in, in the IoT. So when there is going to be IoT devices in every lab out here, the communication Link uh, is going to be very low, 100 kilobits per second. In fact, you can ex extend that sort of that uh, parsimony in the Internet of Things to actually everything. You'll see that the core Internet is resource rich. Every router there is dual power supplies, air conditioned, hundreds of GB of maybe uh, 100 GB of RAM, terabytes of uh, of space, very high performance processors. Whereas the other end, in the Internet of Things, you want cheap devices. Devices you can essentially put it and forget about. They cannot be very power hungry. If they can't be power hungry, they can't communicate far. They have, they have short communication links. If they have to be, they have to be power, not power hungry, they cannot communicate very high bit rate. Because wireless communication, as you know, if you have a poor coverage, the battery drains faster. So clearly, if you want to be parsimonious in power, and parsimonious in, in, in storage, Barcelona has in clock rate, everything, I'll tell you more about the later, they have to be very simple devices. So we are trying to build the IoT with these really resource challenge devices. We build the internet with resource rich devices. We are building IoT with resource challenge devices. So, now, so what is IoT finally? IoT is a platform for CPS. Okay, so just like, just like the World Wide Web runs on the internet, of, in the internet, in a similar manner, CPS will run on IoT. Okay. People often confuse what might done with the internet. So, the internet is a platform. The platform which you can run anything. You can run YouTube, you can run on it uh, gaming, or you can run on it what might In a similar manner, CPS is an application that will run on the internet. So, now, with that background, I now get into some technology. In 1988, when we began the internet, this was the, this was the internet. This was, this was networks in those days. We had a very large and powerful and all-consuming all, uh, telephone network. It was called the BSTN, Publishing Telephone Network. <coughs> there was something in those days called ISBN. ISBN was an apology in those days for multimedia networking. You had an emerging internet. The link speeds there were about tens of kilobits per second to one, I don't know, one megabit per second, one and a half megabit per second in those days. And you had a plethora of protocols, UUCP, NSFNet, TCP, IP, OSI, okay? You had 20,000 hosts in those days. Very small, very small network. Uh, 
a variety of different protocols are emerging. In fact, in the, in the LAN arena, where today we say Wi Fi Ethernet, that's all it is. In those days, the Ethernet, token name, data PPXs, there was a, I don't know, uh, I don't know, a whole variety of different uh, protocols were there. In fact, if you were in the market in those days to buy a network, you were faced with so many choices and you had to make a decision about them. So, this was the era in 88 when we just began to install TRNet in the country. Then, by eight IITs and six IITs and the DOE in those days. So, uh, this was still evolving in those days. <coughs> now, this is an important picture to understand. I'm going to come back to it later. Because today, IoT is in the same status as the internet was in the, in the late 80s. Okay? So, we have to understand when we hear a lot about uh, hype about IoT, we understand it is similar to the hype you have heard about internet in those days. Networks now. The PSTN is shrinking. How often do we call it? Well, uh, Android Airtel is so bad in the opening of the landline. But typically, uh, PSTN is, uh, is shrinking. In fact, in the UK, I'm told they've turned the PSTN off. Telephone networks have been turned off. Everything is voice over IP. And that happened in India very soon. So this is shrinking. Internet has become all encompassing. Okay, everybody's carrying internet in their pockets now. There has emerged over the last 20 years, since 1993 94 similar networks, which are of course are very important. And then of course there's Wi-Fi. But this little pink uh, rectangle out here has been there for the last 40-50 years. I think 70s, Klein Rock, Dabadi and all in the US were working on these things called ad hoc networks. What were they? They essentially were people carrying their own telephone, no, sorry, uh, devices and these would communicate multi hop. That is, uh, to communicate from point A to point B, uh, you know, you communicate between uh, you know, one node and the next node and the next node and so on. That's what These things have been around for now uh, 40 years. They've only played a very niche role in the defense forces, particularly in the army, which requires technology. But they have had pretty much no role to play <coughs> in our civilian life. The, the police may use them, the army may use them. This is what's going to come up the age now. Because the IOT will require this. As I already mentioned to you earlier, uh, typically in, when you are putting uh, IoT devices, you never know that you'll be able to get to the infrastructure within the top, so you've got to okay. Let's go back and understand now what this IoT device will look like. So, uh, each of these devices is what we call a smart sensor node. This word won't mean the speck of dust. So when they first built the devices in the 1990s, UC Berkeley, we began to call them boats because they thought that they would really become so small that they are like dust. They are called boats. This is the original Berkeley boat from 1995. This is a commercially available boat for the philosophy which we often use in our labs to do a couple of experiments with. This is a device that we have recently built in ISC for sensing animals and so on and so forth. This is a small device. Uh, this is uh, called Wiki Fall. It's supposed to be carried by older people that if the person falls, then there can be an alarm sent to somebody that the person has fallen. So it's a it's a called Wiki Fall. What do these devices contain? They typically they contain three components. They contain some sensing, some not all of them, some sensors. So temperature, chemicals, light, infrared, biosensors, now it can be a production sensor. Strain sensor, sound vibration. Using technology which is lens, lens with microelectronic mechanical systems, we have technology. And then it will have some processing in it, it will have a small computing in it. So the computing of course is very resource challenge. 16 bit, 8 megahertz, 48 kilobytes of flash, compare that to terabytes of uh, uh, of disk that you have SSD you have a laptop now. 10 kilobytes of RAM compared to that with 8 GB of RAM you have nowadays in some cell phones and a simple operating system. Okay. So now when we have a 48 kilobytes of flash on the device, it's 128 KB now. You can imagine programming that thing. You want to put it to that signal processing, uh, networking, you want to put it to that uh, communication and security, all in 128 kilobytes. It's a big challenge. Okay. Then this is a radio which connects to the to other other nodes in the world, and finally there goes the battery. To give you a sense of the battery size, 100 milliampere hours. The, the battery in your typical Titan watch is 50 milliampere hours. It lasts about a year or two years. 
میکنه هر چی هر میگه تو تازه میگه که امتحان آورد بعدی. تو هم میگه امتحان آورد تو کدام لیگ بعدی است. So you are you want to have a small battery. So all these put together comprises a board. And this is that is a very small size. If you see, this is like a, uh, a key fob. Okay. Now once you have a device like this sitting out in the field, sitting say inside this uh, lighting system, what do you do? I go to take, take batteries every day. Typically, the devices today draw about 10 milliamperes when they are active. So if you have a thousand milliampere on battery uh, and you draw ten milliampere on it, it lasts for two hundred hours. Two hundred hours is about eight days. And they really need much in the battery. Okay. So clearly, if you're putting uh, one of these devices into every uh, uh, light unit here, it is really impractical to do that. <coughs> so if you have a thousand milliampere battery, your uh, lifetime is just about four days. So what do you do? You keep this mostly off. Suppose you keep it off most of the time, only one person active, then you can plus 100, 100 times. Okay? If it is one person active, you get 100 times in lifetime, so it becomes 200 days rather than 2 days. 200 is rather than 4 days. So the, the way you do that is to keep it mostly active. So again, this is, this is the impact of resource challenge, the resource challenge nature. They cannot be used like you would use maybe your, even your, your cam order or your, whatever your uh, webcam on your, uh, your, your laptop, then you get mostly off. What can you do with these things? When they're mostly off, you can't communicate too far, there's hardly any storage, there's very small amount of computer capacity. What, what, what can you do with that? That's the challenge. The, uh, the other possibility is that electronics uh, engineers come up with even better devices. So it's uh, 10 million uh, amperes. You may get devices in the future with only 1 million amperes or 1 million amperes. Then we have to multiply the lifetime by 10 or by 100. Another possibility is really scavenging. So, so if you thought that periodic sensor, that sensor had a battery in it, it never had a battery change. That is because it would derive power from the motion. And the scavenging is going to be an important uh, uh, requirement. And once you have done all of this, then the challenge comes from computer science. Comes from computer science that uh, if now Use this resource challenge device. It doesn't have very much power or very much capacity to compute, and yet build from that a useful, reliable system. I think I'll skip this. Probably this is too technical for. Okay, so uh, people who are a bit familiar with the communication protocols might understand, might recognize this diagram. Typically, you will have an IoT network comprising <coughs> some uh, edge devices, some sensors, uh, and some uh, gateway and communication multi hop. So, this is attached to the wireline internet, and from there, any, any packets you have to go, have to go maybe two hops, one hop. So, uh, this is a protocol stack for, uh, for the IoT network. The gateway will have a protocol stack like this internet, and from the OSI slow pan. And each of these sensors will have both sides like this with an application running here, QDP, and this is the, uh, the lower level stack. The important thing to understand here is only this. The application runs, the application you concern, what's the application you concern with? You're concerned with smart farming, you're concerned with smart health, you're concerned with uh, sensing pollution. That application is running on the end devices, on the sensors which are embedded, on the most they are embedded in the environment. This is only a communication gateway. Okay, and then back to the plot. <coughs> I'll skip this. Now, uh, this is a, a, a this is a plot. This, the only thing I want to convey from this plot, so this is a, a lot of data in here. These, these are the standard chipsets which are available uh, from Texas Instruments, which are used to make these devices. The communication chipsets. Okay. Now, if if you look at these numbers here, if you have ever looked at the kind of signal strength that the Wi-Fi receiver is getting, if you take your cell phone and ask the cell phone, what am I getting on my Wi-Fi receiver at home? You get numbers like minus 50 dBm, minus 60 dBm. Whereas this is getting minus 88, this is a thousand times less signal power we use in these devices. <coughs> 
So not only do you get very low signals, you get high error probabilities. So that there's a lot of challenge in trying to build uh, networks which have to be very short and uh, and, so, uh, and not tolerant to a lot of error. The error probabilities here that I'm showing you, the operating points are about uh, one percent. One percent probability. Okay. Okay. Now. I'll just tell you about one technical problem that we have worked with, worked with that will be of interest to people who design these networks. Here's a problem that come up now. Suppose that you want to instrument some area, some area like a farm, like this room, with these devices. There will be in some corner of the room or some corner of the farm, the farm infrastructure, the place that you want to get the, the measurements to. There will be different places in that farm or the room or the building or whatever but there are sensors. One application of sensors in the building is the LPG gas leakage sensor. We want to make sure that every kitchen has an LPG sensor so that if LPG gas leaks, you can alert the apartment owner. And then in between there are places where you can place relays, so in axis. The design problem is tell me where I can place relays so to connect these sensors to the station that the number of relays is small and I'm able to get some reasonable probability delivery of the alarm from the sensors to the station. This is an interesting design problem, this is a computer science kind of a problem. This can be one of the uh, exciting uh, sort of areas that the IOD is being is, is being geared for is the industry. The industry is very interested in IOD. Okay, and if I get one in it, Industry 4 Auto, it's like the fourth industrial revolution coming for the industry. And so there, 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 there's an expectation that a lot of the, um, the uh, logistics, the inventory management in the industry will also be supported by uh, So I, I just give all of this, this is a little bit technical. <clears throat> this is the last second slide I have to show. When I talked about this cloud at the back, I gave the impression that you want to build system like this. You have Measurement in the field, like the farm, like the lights, like the, the environment. And all the measurements will be transported over the network to the back end. When you do the processing, you make a difference. But that's a very efficient way of doing things. Because you can imagine the kind of data that you'll be carrying all the time, all from, from, from all the sensors to the back end. Large amount of data, probably unnecessary. So, a very important uh, uh, sort of uh, research problem is how do I do the computing? In the in the network itself. Okay. So can I suppose that I have so so to give you an example of that, suppose that I have a very simple network comprising say n n of these devices laid out in a line. <coughs> and suppose this is the network from this side, this is the infrastructure. And each of these devices is measuring temperature rates, temperature, or pollution level. And I want to find out where in this line is the temperature the maximum, maybe it's a fire starting there. Where in this line is the pollution the maximum, maybe it's a bad place to go, I won't, I won't go there. So I basically want to get the maximum of any values. I can do it in two ways. I can send all the values to the base station, to the uh, cloud, and that computes. But see what happens. If I send this value all the way to the cloud, it has to pass through n, n links. Right? Which means it has to burn energy in n of those devices. Energy is at a premium here. If you have to send this value all the way up, you have to, you have to, you have to traverse n minus 1 links. So you can see it is n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 all the way to 1 or n squared. So if you require n squared uh, exponential energy to be able to do this. But this is not a way of doing things. This is something very simple. What I can do is, this fellow self send the value to this fellow. It computes the maximum of those two values. Then forward the maximum of these two to this fellow. That's also for the problem is done. So instead of having n squared <coughs> complexity for the problem, it becomes the n. So I have dramatically reduced the amount of energy consumption in the system. This is only a very simple illustration of motivation for computing in the network rather than computing in the cloud. Okay? So the, uh, as the system emerges, that you can understand more and more how to use these simple devices in a more efficient manner, what you will find is that a lot of things are going to happen in the network. <coughs> Computation, optimizations, processing, 
clause and condition or going to be done in the network rather than we push back to it. <coughs> so finally, if you want to look at complete application architecture, what you have is that you have all the sensors which are in the, on people's bodies or uh, in, in plants in a farm or whatever. There are relays, there are communication relays, there are the edge devices, there is the internet uh, analytics. Then, for example, if you are building a healthcare application, okay, so what is there in the cloud? In the cloud, you have patient records, and you have the analytics and inference, okay, and then you have actuation. Actuation is send the doctor. <coughs> Could even be activated in a very sensor. If you give the patient a little pulse so that the heart there are many other challenges. Uh, in the communication person, I have, I have focused on communication. Many challenges which I have also already mentioned earlier. I'll keep them now. How do you build a distributed system comprising these very large number of small, small, small resource challenge devices and be able to deliver to the, to the customer, to the, the, uh, the patients or the farmer, probably correct reliable system? How do you manage this with large systems or very you know, resource challenge distributed devices? How do you, if you want to use systems to control, as, as you have to do in that really cyber type, the spinning and the, the large communication, how do you ensure that you are in control loops are working there? It requires the real time guarantees. And uh, security is a very important thing, privacy is a very important thing we have to do. It's all exciting. We talked about CPS, which is a big vision. About IoT, which is a new technology. Where's all this going? If you look at the so McKinsey, of course, as you know, is a very uh, well-known consulting company. Every year, they bring out technology reports. If you look at their list of technology which they see are very important for us, this is the list that they have given this year. Mobile internet. This is the most important technology in the year to come. Automation and knowledge work. Okay, this is actually machine learning and uh, analytics. Internet of Things is the third technology they have mentioned. Cloud technology, cross robotics, autonomous systems, self-driving vehicles, genomics, and the storage field and so on. So IoT is up there somewhere. And when you think about it, these three really work together. Analytics, mobile internet, and IoT are also sort of really part of the same technology. Also cloud. Some years back, just about three years back, ASF uh, gave out the call for proposals. CPS will transform the way people interact with their systems. Just as the internet transformed the way people interact with information, it's a very interesting statement of it. However, these goals cannot be achieved without regular system engineering. The CPS of tomorrow will need to far exceed the system of today, capability, adaptability, resiliency, game security, and usability. So this was it involved proposals for CPS research three years back. <coughs> this is a training program for IoT, brought by IoT Building. Grand vision out here. They talk about 250 million uh, devices. They talk about a 15 trillion global GDP effect. I mean, these numbers are sort of mind boggling. 15 trillion is the, is the GDP of the US all together. But these are the kind of numbers that people throwing around nowadays as expectation from, from IoT. So there are training programs in IoT today and IEEE is trying to tell people, get trained, it's a very big technology. India has an innovation initiative in IoT as well. The AP, ERNet and NASCOM have put together something called the IoT Center of Excellence. Then there is the IoT, a combined initiative of the recordings in IT, ERNet, NASCOM. It's expected to promote an IoT ecosystem which is vibrant, same time the way will help our country the leadership role in the world. And you all know perhaps there is something called the Gartner Hype Curve which comes out every year. <coughs> Where is the IoT on this Gartner Hype Curve? IoT sits right now at the peak. It's exactly at the peak. So IoT has reached what is called the peak of the hype cycle. Okay? And uh, as we all know, after it has peaked, it is going to have a certain deflation. And we were 10 years before IoT actually begins to become a business, you know, something that people make money. And again, I would like to recall for you that very, it's a very similar situation to what was happening with the internet in the 1980s. Probably if you had a Gartner light bulb in those days, 
probably would have seen the internet sitting at the top of the line in the mid 80s and the, the late 1980s. Ten years later, when the worldwide then started, it was only then the internet became what it is today. So I expect that to, 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 be, uh, to be seven to eight to ten years time before IoT becomes a viable technology. What are the challenges for IoT adoption today? There are very few established business models which should profit today. These become clear when this is like caution about in adoption. The flow of emerging standards, exactly the way it was in the internet in the late 80s, too many standards, very confusing for a business person, for a customer as to what they should do, what they should install, will the investment be protected. And there's a big power of security and trust, people do not trust IoT. Can we trust our, our, you know, our data from IoT with IoT systems? So, but there's a lot of expectations from it, 10 years hence. Uh, this is a legacy report again. They say IoT is still early stages of growth. For the next decade, the number of devices expected to increase dramatically. The estimates are 25 billion, 50 billion. Potential impact of trillions of dollars. And there's importance that uh, this will all happen only if the probability and the integration are somehow brought about. If you have a smart traffic system, you should also go to the smart traffic system. And today, we are using only about 1% of data, whereas the, the amount of data available out there is 100 times. And we only will be able to utilize more data effectively to the IoT data. Right. So I will probably not spend too much time on this. I will just uh, uh, tell you about one thing here that in uh, 2011, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam inaugurated this uh, Robert Bush Center for Service Systems, the ISC, which is funded by Robert Bush Foundation and the Land Profit Act. And uh, this center has this kind of a structure. The Robert Bush Foundation gives us a land profit grant every year, about uh, 11 crores. And uh, this is the center of ISC, which we <coughs> interact with the government, society, and industry, trying to further research in the CPS. We work in the area of buildings, water, mobility, healthcare, and culture. Yeah, the vertical and horizontals are you know, security, communication networks, wireless networking, and so on and so forth, and the devices. By the way, a, another example of IoT application is in the monitoring of renewable energy. Whenever you install a solar, a solar panel on your rooftop, you can't leave it alone. And if you have thousands of solar panels for a certain city, it will all monitor individually. This is the way you apply it. Final remarks, advances in sensors, materials, uh, low power electronics, wireless communication techniques, low power and then processing, computing, signal processing, and network algorithms are coming together. Giving us unprecedented capabilities for embedded sensing, just for a difference in the control. And this is the basis for IoT instruments. And there appear to be essential offering challenges of smart living, aging populations, water, energy, and environment. Will CPS and IoT ever get badly adopted? The current indications are that they will. But it's time to tell. Thank you very much. Same kind of sensor in different areas, like 
to sense temperature, the source will be different. Uh, what type of sensor will be there? The sensor will depend upon the application. Clearly, if you are you sensing, you know, an infestation in a plant, there has to be a sensor, a chemical sensor. If you are sensing, for example, the level of light under a lamp, the light sensor. If you are sensing the oxygen in the person's blood, we have an oxygen sensor. There are different sensors, different applications. Sometimes you have multiple sensors on the same device, different applications. Then, uh, if you take one sensor, it will, it will be having some sensitivity, uh, that receiving some strength signal, okay? If it cross the strength, signal strength, if it is more, what happens to the sensor? Well, you, you will have to design the sensor for sensitivity you expect from it. If the, if the level of the, uh, the level of the uh, phenomenon to be sensed goes beyond the sensor's dynamic range, it tells you not work. That is sensor design issue. Have you been used in any defense forces like air force? Because you are talking about business model as about profitability. In a defense force, probably business model may not be more important than actual efficiency. Uh, have you found in any of the countries like US, UK, or anywhere else, defense forces? Well, uh, apart from business model, you also concern about privacy, concern about robustness. Defense will typically expect you to have much more robust systems than this can often allow. So I know that people are trying to use uh, technology like this for testing and CS. Being after it lands during the testing phase, but there is actually case on the on the wings. Testing is done and then they are removed. So uh, I would say that the deployment of technology of this type is still experimental pilot projects. Uh, I cannot point you to any production system, any business system where this is actually being used in a you know from day to day, day after day for a long period of time. Thank you. Well, you talked about uh, the sensors in automobiles, but uh, this type of application is already available in the aircrafts by fly-by-wire method and all that. So uh, it was uh, for a was uh, uh, the technology was available uh, about more than about two to three decades back, and uh, why so much of time is taken to introduce it to automobiles? I mentioned that in the 70s and 80s itself, sensors were there in mobiles. What is different today is that it's a large number of sensors connected by wireless networks. That is the new thing. So the technology of a sensor sitting inside your inner wall of your tire, giving information about the road condition, the eye condition, is something new. The basic concept of a CPS with sensor and actuation and computer is 50 years old. Nothing new in that. What is different out here is very large number of sensors embedded in the system, in the large system, virus communication, and uh, trying to do what we can with that. And of course, this whole thing about smartphones or smart cities is a new area. Sir, for the health management of a man, see what we have a mobile phone. Like that, a small gadget separately has to be kept in the package, something to sense all the, uh, say, body temperature, body uh, diabetes, uh, sugar, any such things. So, uh, whether all those things will be embedded in the same phone or in everything? Telephone, call, everything. Okay, so there are various uh, experiments being done. I can give you give some idea of some of the experiments. One experiment has been done all over the world, is to use the cell phone itself for various diagnostics. For example, one of my colleagues is trying to infer blood pressure by the color of the person's face. Okay, so you can turn the camera on, look at it, there is an application which can perhaps help you be able to infer blood pressure. Okay. So such things are emerging, where you can use the, camera, the, the cell phone the phone sensors. But if you want to, for example, uh, monitor a person's blood uh, oxygen, you know, uh, then you have to put a device on the finger. If you want to sense a person's, uh, you know, heart condition, you may want to put a device closer to the pulse, maybe the wrist or maybe the chest. So what may happen for, for seriously in people, uh, sensors placed on their bodies, 
you can pull the little care what are the ways of doing that. Already you have these big built all of these things. And finally your your cell phone becomes the conduit to the internet. So there will be various uh, you know, ways which should be done. Yeah, so uh, there has been discussion about IoT being used in the railway context. Uh, again, when we are dealing with safety critical systems, you know, first of all, you have to prove this for yourself. Is, uh, is robust and uh, efficient. So although there is a discussion about it, using them in practice is not being done. For example, there was a, there was a project some years back of trying to put sensors in the Portland, Portland uh, railways that are apparently not landslides out there. You wanted to put sensors in the uh, surrounding hills. So that was a project that was done and uh, they showed some results and then it was bombed up. The time has not yet come when we can depend upon these devices to really uh, keep us safe and uh, in less time. Thank you for an interesting lecture on the IoT and uh, for uh, many of the sensors we need an ideal or average reading which is actual for the body or something. But uh, it needs very much data, so much data to be analyzed and stuff and it needs too much investment also. So, isn't that more important than designing the thing? Because uh, that's the, whether it actually works depends on the data collected. See, see this whole value economics will, will depend upon many things, as I mentioned also earlier. It will depend upon the device itself. It will make the device reliable, robust, cheap, uh, low energy consuming. <clears throat> and it requires you to transfer the data from the device to some computing platform. So you have wireless communication. And then you have to have computing platforms which will be able to give you the inference uh, you know, uh, effectively. And then you have to have the algorithms for doing that. All of that has to come together. Okay, so it could be that somebody asked me, it could be that your cell phone itself is a computing device. You have sensors in the body of various sorts. And the cell phone itself is, is a computing device. So it's the first level of computing. It's a very computing. And then in case require more support from doctors, you can have the information sent further off to the internet. It's going to all have to work together. You won't be, you know, uh, uh, there also be a right of architectures. You won't be just a certain architecture. Um, you mentioned that uh, the problem of security, but you didn't really expand on that. Um, I'm not talking about Stuxnet and things like that, but on which I believe the last word has been said. But isn't that one of the reasons why there hasn't been as wide an acceptance of IoT and systems based on IoT, whether it's safety critical systems or security critical systems? The second thing is more in the nature of a comment. And for example, you talked about how. 30% of traffic in a city is, in a developed country is based on vehicles finding a place to park. Now, I don't want to be sound too dismissive, but in some ways IoT is a bolt-on system. And if one doesn't recognize that things like smart cities initiatives may bypass things like the importance of a public transportation system, or if we are talking about water distribution, that finding leaks is important. But as uh, a former chairman of the Bangalore Water Supply and Storage Board has pointed out, the cities with the lowest leakage levels are large cities, uh, Tokyo and Singapore, which have stainless steel pipes. Now, New York City and Bangalore are not much different, because they have an aging system that hasn't been designed to wear. And, I'm, and the reason that I'm making this comment is that sometimes when one is looking for technological sophistication, one tends to ignore more basic questions that need to be handled. Yeah, so I completely agree. There are many questions in that. When people talk about smart cities, I often tell them, they look at two levels of smartness. The smartness that a person gets when you 
put smart in good clothes. So that is the first step from Dowdy to smart. And then you, you become cyber, cyber smart. Certainly, we have to pass through a phase. You cannot simply, as you just said, putting sensors and garbage cans will not solve the problem. And you have to first of all have the government in the city. Very clear. So, I think the smart city projects probably will be making a big mistake if they, if they jump from where they are today, simply putting smarts in the sense of cyber smarts in the city. That, that cannot be done and that should not be done. Going back to the question of security. You know, uh, <clears throat> Security is a, is, is, a, is a problem which we, uh, as human beings, react to in different ways. Okay. Uh, some years back, it was felt that the only way to keep our money secure was to keep it to our mattress. And yet, uh, we all come across the banks with our money. So, and there is a certain amount of risk that we have, the bank can crash, and then the money can be all lost, and the lockers can be broken into. Uh, so, there are different levels of security. And uh, I would say that the deal breaker perhaps here is not so much security. The deal breaker here is the robustness of the reliability of the system, which is still very far from proven. Thank you, sir.